Hi everybody, I'm on a section of the A2 to Dundrum Road on something that looks rather suspiciously like it might have carried another form of transport at some point in the last 100 years. And that's because it did. So today we're going to what the railway poster is called the Queen of Irish Watering Places. For 11 years, from 1858, Down Patrick was the southern terminus of the Belfast and County Down Railway, until in 1869 the prosaically named Down Patrick, Dundrum and Newcastle Railway then extended the line to the small seaside resort in the shadow of the Mourne Mountains, at a cost of £39,000, roughly £4.5 million today. And as with many ventures in Victorian society, the railway was instrumental in development and an active catalyst rather than a passive service transforming Newcastle from a sleepy seaside village, although with obvious tourist potential thanks to its position at the foot of the Mourns, to a bustling destination for the well-heeled members of Victorian society. The original station was a small affair and was roughly where these shops sit today, lying along the railway as opposed to being perpendicular to it. Whereas the familiar clock tower building that we know today is actually the second station, opened in 1906. It was much grander and was designed as the terminus of not one, but two lines, as I'll explain in a bit. Mind you, the new station's design wasn't to everyone's taste. Some thought the clock tower in Congress, like it had been borrowed from a much bigger building, and the portico at the front, now long gone, didn't really serve its intended purpose as the jaunting cars waiting outside couldn't use it. These days, although its current occupant, Little, has been trying to escape for years to area accommodation, the building was recently refurbished, with the exception of the scruffier east wing, which presumably belongs to someone else. Inside, sadly, the once cosmopolitan concourse has all been stripped away, leaving only this original drinking fountain in place. It incidentally asks patrons to keep the pavement dry. Back outside, the supermarket car park is where the trains arrived. To the left, the red brick wall is the same one bordering the platform in this photo, with the sign showing the way to the hotel. Again, we'll get to that hotel in a second. On the opposite side of the car park is this older looking wall, presumably dating from the opening of the first station, which separated the platform from the goods yard. And this, in later days, was the rough location for the railway plaza, a refreshment stop for those who didn't fancy scaling the mountains. And when you'd had your lemonade, a new pursuit was taking hold beside the station on what were formerly rabbit warrens. Although golf, or at least a basic form of it, had been played in this site for a while, in 1889 a group of gentlemen made use of the new railway line to form the Royal County Town Golf Club, even getting old Tom Morris over from St Andrews to help model an enjoyable and challenging Lynx course. By this time the BCDR had bought out the Downpatrick, Dundrum and Newcastle Railway, and not only did they build the clubhouse, they soon started laying on the Golfers Express, a Saturday-only service that whisked its plus four clad passengers from Queen's Quay to Newcastle without the nuisance of stopping at any intermediate station. Although, its occasional arrival with level crossing gates stuck to the front of the engine suggests that this arrangement hadn't been well communicated. The train itself was literally fit for royalty. Carriage 153 was built in 1897 for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, and although the Queen herself never used it, her son, Edward VII, and grandson, the future George V, did when they visited Ireland. And when not on duty, the carriage was used as a first-class carriage for Royal County Down members only, and is currently under the care of the Downpatrick and County Down Railway awaiting restoration. But what about those golfers who didn't fancy the return trip to Belfast? Well, most railway hotels in the network were pretty unprepossessing, occupying the likes of existing town or terraced houses. But with the Sleeve Donard opened in 1898, they really went for it. And even now, it's an impressive sight. It was as self-sufficient as it could be, with its own bakery, vegetable gardens, pigs, and even its own power plant, which, on top of providing electricity for the Turkish baths, also served the railway station. The relationship between the railway, the hotel and the golf club was symbiotic, with everybody scratching each other's backs. But a relationship that was perhaps less beneficial for the BCDR was whenever it was arm wrestled into accepting an intruder on its patch, the much larger Great Northern Railway of Ireland. The GNR fancied a slice of the County Down Seaside Resort business, on which obviously the BCDR by its nature had a monopoly, and announced its intention to extend its existing line from the small hamlet of Ballyroney, where it had this station. The BCDR weren't too happy about this, but the authorities didn't care and forced the two to find a solution for the greater good. And in exchange, the BCDR asked for the right to run the trains all the way north to Scarba, presumably to meet the Dublin Main Line, but they didn't get that far. They were only allowed to run the trains as far as here at Ballyroney to where the GNR had started, and because there was next to no point, they never did. And given 
that this arrangement massively benefited the GNR, they did the bulk of the work as far as Castle Wellham, and the BCDR completed the connection, a three mile addendum to its extensive network and the only new rail it laid in the 20th century. And although Castle Wellham was built by the GNR, it was a shared station, with the staff swapping between the two company uniforms every year. But more importantly, the GNR now had the right to run its trains to Newcastle. In the same year, the new station building came along in 1906. On each platform were two clock faces, showing the time of departure for the next Belfast and the next Dublin trains. Both companies ran trains to Belfast along their own routes, but only the GNR could get you to Dublin via the rather long-winded route of going as far north as Scarva and then changing. If you weren't fussed about how you got there or where you passed, you were better off with the BCDR's shorter journey to get into Belfast. But, of course, we all know how the story ends, and even Newcastle's seasonal popularity could not prop up the railway for the rest of the year. And in 1949, the Ulster Transport Authority announced that the BCDR's main line would close on the 16th of January 1950. And although Newcastle was still served by GNR trains, they were also withdrawn on the 2nd of May 1955, sadly leaving the station with no train service at all. <laughs>